can a PDA child read our intention or energy beneath the surface of what we say and our behaviors? This was a question that I got in the recent Paradigm Shift program during a Q&A, and it was from a dad, and he said, well, how could they possibly read the energy if we're not showing it? And my response was, hi everybody, there's two ways to think about it. One is in the woo-woo way of like reading actual energy, like with chakras and like if we're thinking about prana and all that, which is like a child can actually read energy beneath the surface of what you're saying and doing, or we can look at it in a more scientific way, which is actually based on neuroception, which is like, is it really energy or is it like the subtle micro movements and fluctuations in tone that most people aren't gonna notice consciously? Because remember from the amygdala or the survival brain, it processes, that part of the brain processes information 50 to 200 milliseconds faster than the rational part. And so a child with a hyperactive survival part of their brain, which is PDA, is going to perceive subtle shifts, movements in your behavior that you might not be noticing. So the reason I bring this up to start our, hi everybody, <clears throat> to start our Coffee with Casey is because our au pair arrived, our bro pair arrived from Colombia on Saturday and he doesn't speak much English. So we've been speaking entirely in Spanish in our household, which is really fun for me um, because I love speaking other languages. But, you know, it can be a source of worry of like, how is he going to connect with the kids if they can't speak Spanish, etc. But my son perceives his energy, which is like chill, right? And so even though they're not communicating a lot verbally, um, my son has been like sitting next to him and like smushing into him and showing the, him things on his iPad and on his um, iPhone because he's really into football right now. So he's playing like football apps and looking at football rankings and stuff. Hi, everybody. So anyways, I just wanted to share that anecdote because um, it's like playing out in real time in my home in a very... Um, clear way because it's actually like impossible for them to interact with just verbal communication but it is not um, getting in the way of or precluding connection so it's just an observation I want to share with you guys um, the coffee with Casey today is going to be a little bit shorter because I am in the middle of transitioning my old au pair out um, and she's training the new au pair, and I have a lot of my own energetic stuff going on, trying to make sure everybody feels comfortable and accommodated and included. So we have about 13 minutes <laughs> to say hi, connect, and I'd love to hear how you guys are doing, if you have questions. Um, one thing that's exciting and that's on my mind, I don't know if you guys saw, but Mona Delahook, who I love her work. She wrote Beyond Behaviors and Brain Body Parenting. She's a clinical psychologist here in the US. And she posted yesterday about protective demand avoidance on her tiles, which was so exciting because it's like a clinical perspective that's very much aligned with the way that I understand PDA, which is you know, a protective mechanism in response to demands, which is related to the nervous system, which is also how I understand PDA. So I was very excited to see that. Um, also because it signals a, a building awareness in more clinical therapeutic medical spaces, which I'm very excited about and think is a really good thing. Yeah, so the neurodiversity mom said that's such a great observation. We experience the energy reading too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for sensitive nervous systems, like it might not be quite as pronounced as like my PDA son who reads every micro shift, 
but like sensitive people, empaths, neurodivergent individuals can often read and perceive and take on in a porous way the energy of others in a way that's not how everyone experiences other people's emotions. Yeah, hi. Nice to see you. Hiya from the UK. Hello. Love the info you share. I'm so glad it's helping you understand your child. Yeah, I loved Mona Della Hook's perspective. No harsh labeling. Yeah, and very like objectively identifying and naming the causal mechanism of like why it's happening. Yeah. So from Eileen, I'm heading on holiday next week with my 10 year old PDA son, traveling separate from his dad and my other son, any tips? Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is just, if you can, um, try and enjoy that time because I think that's so annoying to say. I guess not enjoy, but just like the practice being staying present and observing your son how he may be different when there's not like complex energy dynamics of multiple people and having to compete for undivided attention, etc. Um, when I've traveled with just my PDA son, I've actually found it to be a really great opportunity for connection because I can really just be child led of like, okay, we're going to go here today and then he changes his mind and we go off in another direction and the more you know, I don't know what your travel plans are, but the more you can let go and let him guide how the how the time unfolds, I think the more opportunity for fun and connection there is. Um, also, not putting pressure on yourself for doing too much because sometimes when we travel, we're like, we have our, our bucket list and we have our activities planned and remembering that, well, these kids need dopamine and they really like novelty often. So often they do do well traveling. They also will experience the need to possibly retreat into the hotel room or another room if you're staying with family and not participate and just be on a screen. So I think taking that pressure off yourself is another good step. Yeah. So Grow Up IG says, can you talk about internal versus external presentations? Sure. So I would be happy to give you guys a sense of the patterns that I've observed um, through my work with like hundreds of families. So this, whenever I talk about patterns, it's not necessarily going to apply to every single data point in the distribution. It's just like on average what I've observed. So First, to define the difference between an internalized expression and externalized expression of PDA, I want to emphasize that like the root cause is the same, right? So it's like the amygdala, the survival part of the brain, perceiving on a subconscious level threat due to a perceived loss of autonomy or equality from those around the child or individual. Right? So that's the mechanism. That's what starts the nervous system to have a reaction. So when the brain perceives, like for all of us, when the brain's like, I'm going to die, it tells the rest of the body to react in a survival way so that we stay alive. It's an evolutionary, biological, physiological mechanism. So for the externalized expression, we're going to have a fight flight expression of that nervous system response. So what that means is the body's like, okay, you're gonna have to fight off the lion or run away from it. And what that is, is the body saying, prepare the body, let's get away from the lion through this way of surviving. So the metabolism speeds up, cortisol and adrenaline release to the body, blood, um, from the internal organs rushes to the extremities in order to be able to fight or flee. Okay, and so some of these kids, like my son is an externalized expression, physiologically are gonna have things like diarrhea, maybe vomiting, maybe not feeling hunger because the metabolism is speeding up versus an internalized expression, which is still threat response. It's just more of a freeze response, which is actually a slowing down of the metabolism blood rushing away from the limbs to the trunk because if you imagine like a gazelle in front of a lion 
if they get bit on the leg, they want less blood there. Okay, so there's actually physiological stuff going on beneath the surface that all of us experience in times when we perceive threat. What this looks like behaviorally is very different than what I just described, right? So for, a, for an externalized expression, what we're gonna see is more defiance, opposition, yelling, running, saying no, um, climbing on the backs of couches, that's more of a flight, um, running out the front door, flight, and you know, hitting, biting, scratching, which is like what a gazelle would do <laughs> if it could against the lion or running away. So those kids look more explosive, defiant, oppositional, violent versus internalized, which is like the playing dead, where you will see more of like a blank look, going in on oneself, turtle shell, um, maybe not being able to speak, like selective mutism, can look like lethargy, disassociative look in the eyes, okay? so. That's the next level, but on the like very superficial level, these kids are going to get labeled like oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD maybe, and the the freeze expressions might be like severe anxiety attachment disorder, like you know can't leave their safe person, but the mechanism is exactly the same. Okay, other patterns I've noticed is that the externalized expression is often more pr pronounced in like needing that undivided attention at every moment versus the internalized expression. You might see a child be able to play more independently, but still have that demand avoidance. Um, additionally, parents often come to PDA later with internalized expressions because you can't see the indicators as much, right? Um, because they're not externalizing. And so a pattern might be these kids are fine, compliant, doing well at school, even a model student, but then they hit sort of a breaking point where all the cumulative stress in their system makes it that they, they can no longer continue. So I'll just stop there because it's kind of a long explanation. Okay. So questions like how do you handle or how do I do this or what to do, those are like a little bit too broad for a short live. Oh, hi, Jen. So there, there isn't an uh, article. It's actually just on Mona Della Hook's Instagram page. So I think she was just floating the terminology for the first time here on social media. I'm so glad, Autumn. Yay, I'm so happy. When the little one gets emotionally hurt but keeps going back for more. I know, I know that dynamic really well. Yeah. Okay, so I just got the same question about like traveling solo. So Ruthie, if you wanna go back and look at the, or listen to the first part of the live, I answered that question. Um, we have a meeting with our son's teachers tomorrow. I think we've shifted to just accepting the traditional school system is probably not a good fit, but would appreciate good vibes. Sending all the vibes, all the vibes, all of them, sending them your way. Um, where I'm sitting in my bedroom, I can like see the public school <laughs> and we've moved into this house so that my son could walk to school, be in a good good public school system and go to school with his cousins here in Michigan. And after a year and a half of fighting with the school system, we decided no gracias. <laughs> That's my terrible, silly Spanish accent. Yes, good question, grow up Instagram. Yes, there can be fluctuations between internalized and externalized presentations. Remember, these are mechanisms like an externalized PDA or can experience times of internalizing the threat response, like for example, if they're masking, or an, an internalized expression if they reach their threshold after all the accumulation, which is what I was kind of talking about, can reach a point where they can no longer hold it in and they go become more externalized, like as teenagers. How do you approach bathroom reminders with children who are still young and not fully potty trained? 
So I think like we can incorporate two things like strewing and three things, managing your energy, strewing and using declarative language. So managing your energy around it is just like thinking of it as like an offering like a sensory cue, like now might be a good time to try the potty versus like you need to do it or else you're going to pee your pants. And I know that you're anxious about it, but like the more you can let go of just like, I'm going to do my half and do the offering consistently. But if they miss the cue, it's okay. Like we'll, we'll clean it up. We'll get new underwear. Like they, shit happens. <laughs> right. Um, that's the first. The second is strewing. So like that's a concept by Sandra Dodd from the homeschooling community. And it's just leaving out visual or sensory cues so that you don't have to use a lot of verbal language. And it's like an offering to engage. So that might be like having the potty, you know, in a place like the living room or having something that signals to the child you know, like the potty is an option, right? Like, and you can do a verbal strewing of like, oh, I feel like I might need to go to the bathroom, period, right? And I know you're going to want to say like, does anyone else need to go or do you want to go? But try experimenting with just like um, using a declarative sentence without an imperative, like let's go to the bathroom or do you want to go to the bathroom? Direct question, because that can set off the threat response and just sort of like noting, offering, visual or auditory cue. And so you're like sort of introducing the topic and providing opportunities without putting a lot of pressure on it. That's what I would say, Stephanie. Yeah, so Eileen says we had an introverted PDA and I could not figure out what was going wrong until now my son is 10. So that's actually like pretty early, Eileen, compared to a lot of the families I've worked with. So, oops, yeah. Um, okay. All right, so I'm gonna probably answer one more question. Let's see. Okay, I like this question. Let me see. Any gentle advice to offer extended family on how to approach greetings and conversations with PDA child? Son usually will ignore, run away, and say to not talk to him, which I understand is due to demand. Okay, so this question has more to do with like communication and communicating your needs as a family to others which gets into like boundaries and people pleasing and codependency and and like feeling the discomfort of disappointing people all of which I understand on a profound and nervous system level this is why we have a whole module about this in the paradigm shift program however um as a starting point I might explore like first, and I don't know you obviously, but I work with a lot of parents and, and I know myself, which would be like, it's okay. Like how they respond is not my responsibility. I'm advocating for my needs and speaking them clearly. And it's okay if they don't understand, I don't have to convince them. I'm just asking, right? And I might focus on making a request without trying to explain every nuance and detail of the deep why behind it of just like, I'd like to make a request. Would it be possible when you arrive in the home to just interact with me and interact with, you know, other family members or, you know, do your own thing without trying to interact with um, my PDA child, because he's kind of like, you know, a cat, the more you like go over to him and are like, Oh, let's interact. Let, let me pet you. They're going to be like, no, thanks. And run away. Right. But like, if you just sit there doing your own thing, I'll come over when they're ready. So that's one way of going about it. Um, I think managing feelings of extended family is, is your personal 
decision and depends on where you are in your burnout journey. I know that three years ago, I did not have the emotional energy to like caretake for other people's reactions to my family situation, but now I do. And I just emphasize like, hey, this is not personal. It actually has nothing to do with you if they don't want to talk, right? And you can go as deep as you want in explanations, but a pattern I often see with families and parents is that they exhaust their themselves trying to um, explain, convince, and and like like convince someone to believe in something when really like that's an energy leak that we don't want to expend energy on. We just want to focus on like what our needs are and communicate them clearly. Okay, I hope that that's helpful for you guys. I have to jump off, but I'll see you here next week if you would like, and you can catch the replay on my tiles. All right, guys. Bye. Have a good day.